You're listening to Blue Collar CEO, the podcast that's all about helping you build a better, more profitable, and more sustainable home service business. Each week, we'll cover a different topic that will help enable your company to move forward to success. And here's your host, Ryan Redding. What is up, Blue Collar CEOs? It is Ryan. Uh, I'm, I can't wait to get into this conversation. We've had this guest on before. He was actually came out on episode 41, where they talked about the things they were doing to build team culture, specifically like they were doing these really cool, like financial competency trainings for their teams. Anywho, enough about the past. Let's talk about now. I'm getting ready to have a conversation with Travis Smith. Travis, if you don't know, is the second generation owner of Sky Heating. Uh, they started Sky Heating in two, he started his role in Sky Heating in 2001 and has been running the company since, uh, since 2009. Uh, they had a plumbing in 2020, electrical in 2021, and in 2022, they just successfully completed an acquisition with the P1 Home Service Group. Uh, and we're going to be talking about all things about the PE process and life after PE. So if you're looking at an exit, if you're thinking about what life is going to be like or things you need to know in advance, we're going to be talking about a lot of those things. Uh, if you are not yet thinking about an exit, this is something you probably want to listen to and keep in mind uh, because there's a whole lot more on the table than just cashing a big check. Let's get Travis uh, going on the call. There's a lot we're going to talk about. Travis, it is really good to see you again. We had you on. I don't remember when it was. Oh, look, you're even doing the little tummies, little tummies. Uh, it is so good to have you on again because it's been, yeah, for those who's listening, like he just did his trademark, like thumbs up, uh, let's maybe just start. I'm, I think a lot of people know who you are, but I'm going to pretend like there's somebody somewhere who are, who's under rock. So let's start. Travis, who are you? What do you do? Or what did you do? How might people know you? So I am the second generation, uh, owner slash kind of, I guess at this point, uh, former owner, even though owner still is how I identify of sky heating and air conditioning here in Portland, technically Tualatin, Oregon. We were founded in 1979 on October 1st by my father. Uh, he started to transition out in the mid 2000s and I came in uh, officially. My first day at work was six months and five days at the company. I've got an actual picture of my baby book that says that. So the worst part is sometimes I'll tell people I've been in this industry almost 40 years and they go, oh, you look pretty good. And I'm like, I'm 39 years old. So uh, I guess the downside is a lot of people think I look old, but that's just construction. Also, maybe you just it's a really poor delivery. Like it, maybe it's not like that you just look old, but maybe it's like you just it was a really bad punchline delivery. Could be, it could be. So I'm just I'm just throwing it out there. I'm trying to figure out how to make myself look younger. It's like dyeing the beard, maybe some hair color. I'm not sure what I got to do to to get that taken care of. Is something. it weird that I do that too? Though I do the like the slightly degray your beard stuff. No, not at all. It was one of my uh, my sales guys. I finally looked at him. I was like, dude, you're a couple years older. How is it that your beard looks so good? He goes, I dye my beard. I went, they, they actually, like, I never thought of that being a thing. So I went to the store and I bought some beard. I haven't right now. That's why there's a little too much gray and I probably look like I'm in my, my 50s. But, uh, you know, construction's been good to me and I am still 39. Still 39. Damn it. Leave me alone. Stop asking questions. You recently have gone through, obviously, Sky under your leadership has gone through a tremendous amount of success. Uh, you focus a lot on like taking care of your, your team culture building has been a huge priority for you. And you do, Absolutely. it's like on our, on our previous episode, like you, one of the things we talked about is like the financial training and planning that you do for your guys, like really, really cool stuff. Yeah. But you recently are going through something of a transition. So maybe for those who don't know, maybe the, the deets, why yeah. don't you like sh spill the beans a bit? Yeah. So a lot of people I, I found out still didn't even know. I posted on Facebook and said, Hey, we've you know taken on a partner here at sky. And people were like, cool, glad to hear it. And like months later, people were like, Hey, uh, you, you sold. And I was like, I posted multiple things. Like people shared it. You commented on it. And they're like, well, I didn't realize that's what it meant, but that I think is also synonymous with how it looks from the outside is how it looks from the inside. Um, if you look at the people here, there's really no changes. And in fact, the equity group is here two weeks ago. And the first thing they said was like, oh my God, the, the smiles on the faces here. Like we knew you had a good culture, but until we saw it firsthand and they'd been in, but the CEO hadn't had a chance to come into the company. He's like, this is unbelievable. This isn't, this isn't what I imagined when I imagined sky heating. So I'd say most people 
wouldn't really notice a difference if, if at all, especially not for the negative, only for the positive. But yeah, September 1st, we went through uh, an exit. And by exit, uh, pretty much I exited and then walked right back in the door and sat my happy ass down in my chair and said, okay, let's get back to work. And that's what the rest of the team did as well, because uh, the only exit was that somebody else came in to um, buy out the ownership of, of Sky and plenty of us reinvested back in and have shares. So if anything, we're probably more equally owned uh, by people in the company than we were prior when it was just myself. At this point, other people have the ability to own the company and partner alongside me and alongside the equity group and alongside multiple other companies. And and that really just brings the the team up and the key players up because they're more important than they ever have been and have more at stake and uh, essentially more skin in the game too, which is a benefit for, I think, everybody. So I think for a lot, a lot of contractors and operators, like you, you are personifying the dream, right? Like scale, get attention, exit, and have a payday. But aside from like the economics of the process, like emotionally, like, cause like running a business, like carrying that strain, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. What has been the transition like for you transitioning from everything's on your shoulders to now you have a group of people who have shared interest, who have now you have a pool of resources greater than what you had before. Like what has been like the emotional process been like for you during that transition? Well, I'm sure my personal trainer wouldn't like to hear that there's a lot less weight on my shoulders now because I know he's trying to get me to always work out, but that's been the biggest thing. My father-in-law was in Spain and they left. Um, that's been their dream. He actually just retired in June of last year. And so they wanted to go visit Spain for a couple of months. He left a couple of days prior to the sale and came back after the sale. One of the first things he said to me is your face just looks so much stressed. You're, I don't want to say that he said my outbursts were less, but let's just say I'm a little bit nicer at home. <laughs> less stressed at home. I'm sure that the kids can see it and feel it, but there's just a, a major weight off my shoulders, knowing that hundreds of people no longer solely rely on me and now rely on a much wider division of people, uh, much bigger backing and a much bigger skill set than I carried by myself or that the team team carried in general. But just going back to the other people in the company, uh, the fact that they can now come to somebody else that you know has part ownership of the company and of the larger organization and the knowing there's more people that have their their back or the supporting them you, know, you talked about the financial training and the stuff that we did those are the pieces that we did it on our own and when you got financial training it was mm-hmm. for myself the president and heather our cfo and we put together kind of our own viewpoints and stuff but it didn't it didn't involve everybody it maybe didn't have enough viewpoints in it and now we have an either uh, an even bigger next level financial training that's larger for part of the group. Uh, we've been able to add on additional benefits as part of the group. We now have a leadership training that we do every Friday so that every person from a warehouseman to a CSR to a, a, a leader in the company or manager gets this leadership training where we read books, have discussions on it, and truly talk about what it means to be a leader, talk about our whys behind all of this, and seeing certain people that I didn't know wanted to be in the forefront of the company coming to the forefront it's been amazing to watch them grow or have those discussions one-on-one and seeing them both grow personally as well as professionally, helping out in their families, helping out in their communities, and of course, helping out here at the company. I've heard, I've heard some like, it's interesting how you're describing it because <laughs> I've sometimes heard instances where when PE comes in, uh, there's a, there's a disruption to the staff or to the culture. Uh, especially if the transactions are done like by the numbers, right? Mm-hmm. If there's no like cultural integration sort of assessment that's ever done. Uh, and I, I've heard of cases like essentially hundred percent turnover within yeah. like, the first 60 days. Um, just not because the PE like pushed people out, but just like the, the shift in culture was so oh, yeah. dramatic that people didn't feel like they belonged. I, it sounds like the exact opposite might yeah. be happening. Like what, how would you describe maybe the anxiety or questions that the staff had pre close and what has it been like for them stepping into the new reality with all these trainings, new opportunities, Mm -hmm. what has that transition been like for the team? Well, there was no knowledge pre close of anybody except for the the executive team. The managers didn't know we announced everything till after the close, just to make sure that nothing came up or threw the transaction off base. But, and in one word better, and I know that's definitely different because I, I love the fact that private equity is coming into some of the other companies in my area. We just picked up plumber, an electrician, a couple service techs, a salesperson, all from companies that their culture was going the opposite direction. And they're like, we're gone. And they come over here and they're like, oh, yeah, we heard you guys went private equity. What's it like? And their friends are like, 
you should come over here now. We told you to come over before, <laughs> but you should really come over now. And I think that's been the change. Like, you know, we talked culture on the last one a little bit, but adding in that leadership training, taking the financial coaching to the next level, um, our all company meetings are just better today. The benefits that we have are better today. The vehicles are newer. It's, I was actually even thinking about this prior to the, uh, the podcast going, okay, I know we're going to talk about some of these things, but originally looking back to my employment agreement and, and P1, I hope that I can say this, but normally they, they don't care. They just want us to operate profitably and happily and have a good culture. And P1 stands for people first, but my employment agreement said I reported to the CEO and I was like, man, that's kind of a, a weird structure for me as the president and CEO of Sky to now report to somebody else. But I really don't feel like I have a direct report. I feel like I have direct support and that's how the role really should be. I always say this, and I probably said this on the last podcast, that your reporting structure is the exact opposite of your supporting structure. If you can't see the hand signs because you're listening, a reporting structure is a triangle facing up and a supporting structure is a triangle facing down because the leaders and managers should be supporting the managers that should be supporting the field foreman that should be supporting the field staff and so on and so forth. And so often people think that it's a one directional street. <clears throat> I love that a P one, the CEO and I can just sit together and just have a conversation like friends. And it's like, what do you need? What resources do you need? What trainings do you need? And I'm like, man, our, you know, our call center is doing great, but I know that one of the other companies in the group has a stronger call center and it's jump into talking to that person about their call center or, Hey, you guys are doing amazing on this area. Can you help these other companies implement this new price book? And we really, really work together as a group of friends versus this stringent reporting structure that so many are used to, where it's very top down. Um, we are not very top down. We're fairly, fairly bottom up. And I'd say almost probably majority bottom up when it comes to the individual companies like ours talking to the larger equity group, we're setting the, setting the direction of everything along with the board and other people, but it's in unison, not, not a struggle against each other. I think a lot of people would be surprised, especially if they've never gone through any sort of M&A process of the, one of the main advantages of having a PE and in some cases like a VE, a VC group come in and, and do an acquisition like this is that you gain access to economies of scale. Absolutely. Right. So like the things that you're talking about only exist because they have a larger base, not just of economic resources, that's true, but also people resources. You have mm -hmm. people with skills and knowledge and experience and capabilities that they can then leverage against the entire network, the entire system. And that helps with everything from training to like implementing price books, uh, purchasing inventory, like all these things get the benefit of that scale. And I, I don't think, uh, I think a lot of people would be surprised about the degree to which that happens. Oh, absolutely. Even on, on a day to day thing like this. Yeah. I was just at a dealer conference last week and talking to another dealer there and he had, I don't know, I think it was 12 or 13 people. And I was looking at his revenue per employee and he was doing about 200,000 per year in revenue per employee. And ours was much higher, uh, almost 40% more. And he's like, Oh, it must be expensive to be a company like yours to have all these people. And I said, what's more expensive you trying to train somebody one off and recruit somebody one off and having to pay all those fees or me who has the branding, who has a recruiter, who isn't taking a profit on that recruiting because they don't have all those other operational costs that just part of the business. And me who's training three people at once and me who's buying in bigger volume. And I said, on top of that, we're running more efficiently because look at our revenue per employee versus yours. And he kind of had this like, Oh, he'd always thought that he must have ran at a lower cost because he was a smaller company. And the reality is we're the one running at a lower cost because we're a larger company because of those economies of scale. And I assure you at 12 people, he's probably a lot more stressed because it's like, Travis, how do you, how do you find time to go fly your plane? What do you mean? I'm, I don't got that much to do during the day. We have an amazing team here. We have an amazing GM, an amazing operations person, an amazing CFO. They're all here to support that. And just the team works so cohesively because we have those right managers in place that it really reduces the stress and pulls off of your workload. I was way more stressed. In fact, I hospitalized myself three separate times when I was a 15 to 20 person company over anxiety and stress. Um, at one point I was sitting in a hospital bed with 160 beat per minute heart rate. I go to stand oh, up and it was up to 180 and the tachycardia monitor starts going off and people come in the room and I'm like, what? I'm standing up. <laughs> it's 180. 
I don't have that stress level. Now my resting heart rate's like, you know, in the fifties, that that's a huge difference. Uh, being a larger company, yeah, there's bigger problems, but it's not the same. It is definitely, definitely easier. There is more support. It's almost like, uh, what, what's the whole thing? Like, you know, those guys who like walk on coals or like walk on the bed of nails sort of thing. Like any, when you only have like five or 10 nails, whatever, supporting like the weight of a human, that's a lot of force being exerted on just five or 10 nails, right? You're going to notice every single one of those things. Um, and if you're leading a company that's like uh, even up to like 20 trucks, right? You could be five, even like maybe even up to 10 mil in a lot of cases where it's like, you just feel the weight of everything. Everything swings so much. But once you get kind of out of that little, uh, like zone of despair, yeah. right now, all of a sudden you have like a larger bed of nails, your, your decisions, your responsibilities, the stress is distributed out over a larger base where every little nail doesn't quite feel as big of a deal. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, to your point, yeah, you still, when the problems come up, they're bigger problems, but you have a larger surface area of a larger team, probably better equipped team uh, mm -hmm. to be able to navigate those. So you can go fly your plane. Yeah. And on the PE side, just the support that's provided there, it's a lot easier because it's like, Hey, how should we handle X, Y, or Z? And I forget what issue came up recently, but we're all sitting there perplexed going, gosh, we have no idea. You know what? We'll call somebody that this, I hate to put it off and say, oh, it's not our problem, but it was like, this doesn't need to be our problem. We have somebody that can assist with this. Are you able to call? figure out what other companies were doing, get the answer. And it wasn't, you know, there's great communities on Facebook as we all know. And that's where we met. That's where most people yeah, yeah. know me, know me from. And there's great support, but there's only so much support. That's a one sentence, maybe a paragraph long answer. When you have somebody else that has a lot of money invested in your company, you're going to get a really good answer. That's well thought through that brings everything around because the, what you implement affects them and what they tell you affects you. So you have the symbiotic, feeling that you just can't get anywhere else. You just can't get when you don't have actual money reinvested into that person. So it's definitely a big weight off the shoulders and a, a great way just of idea sharing that there's a reason why I'm on Facebook a little bit less too, because I'm sharing now with the group versus others. Are you, are you insinuating perhaps that people who just rattle off opinions on Facebook might not always be the most helpful resources? I will say this. The less I knew, the more I rattled off. Because the more you rattle off, the more you sound like you know something. So if you took advice from me five years ago, I'm sorry, I probably led you the wrong direction. And today I'll probably lead you the wrong direction as well, but it'll be a much better educated direction. Just because I've, I've seen that happen so often is that you try and justify what's right. And the more right you are, the less you need to justify it. And uh, I've been in that. I've, I've been a victim of it. You've, I'm sure, seen other people on Facebook that have came back and said that. And like, yep, a couple of years ago, nope, I was a little ways off base. Um, and appearances can be be everything. I actually was at the Westin last week. And I got to tell this quick story because it was so funny. There was an event that had like these famous athletes. I'm not a sports guy. There was Ken Griffey Jr., who I guess is a baseball player for the Seattle, or was a baseball oh player for the Seattle Mariners you, in Seattle. You guess he's a baseball player. That. You just hurt my heart a little bit, man. So I sat next to uh, Saquon Barkley on a plane one day. I said, I, this is how little I know about sports. I'm sitting on a plane and this guy sits down next to me, big hoodie. Like you can tell he doesn't want to be bothered. And we're flying to Portland and people walk by him and they pat him on the shoulder. Like, dude, great job last week. A couple guys later, Hey man, you killed it on my fantasy team. And I finally look over. I'm like, can, can I ask what you do? And he goes, Oh, I play for the giants. And I'm like, what sport is that? And he's like, oh, I'm an NFL running back. And I'm like, cool. My sister loves football. Can I ask your name? And he's like, oh, it's Saquon Barkley. And I'm like, awesome. Hey, congrats on the good game, I guess. And he just looked over like, thank God this guy doesn't know who I am. He ended up later on coming to me and being like, hey, where's our baggage claim? Because he knew that I wasn't going to bug him. I didn't want a photo with him. I didn't, I didn't care. So that's how little I know about sports because I'm sure he's like, how do you not know Saquon Barkley? I still couldn't tell you who he is to this day. I just know that I sat next to him once and we exchanged a few words and he was glad to be there. But Ken Griffey Jr. was there. Gary Payton was there. So it was like this hoity-toity. They had a medical event and this sports event, and we were there. It says to wear pants on the podcast today. That, that was part of your instruction, so I do have pants on, but they're just a, you know. Good job. From I'm proud of you. Stand up just to prove I, I do have pants. But I'm sure nobody's done that. Nope. This is the first. This is the first. I will forever etch a stay into my memory. 
I was dressed like this, my normal self, you know, as a contractor, my Costco pants, my normal t-shirt on. I wore a nice watch, okay? That's my that's my claim to fame. I'm always going to have a nice watch on. And so I'm talking at the bar because the bar is backed up from these sports stars that are there. And this lady comes over and we're waiting and waiting. The guy behind me are talking and conversation kind of ends. And she and I start talking and she's like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to get a drink for my husband and I over here. And I said, oh, what, are you, what event are you guys here for? And they said, oh, we're here for this medical one. What about you? And I said, oh, I'm here with the an HVAC contractor event tomorrow night. And she looks at me straight face and goes, oh, this must be a really nice place for you. And kind of says it like she's talking to a kid. And I was like, oh, my gosh. What? <laughs> If you knew what our industry was doing right now, it just goes to show like how our industry still needs to be brought forward. And I think private equity is really going to be that piece to put us on the map. Um, it was restaurants. It was veterinary clinics. It's doctor's office, dentist office. They've all been PE owned. But looking at the people like Ken Goodrich out there and Leland Smith and Ishmael and Ken Haynes and all the other greats in our industry, they're going to start putting our industry on the map so that we gain back what we rightfully are owed. And in our leadership trainings, we were talking about the book Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And yeah, we were talking book. about some of the brand statements. You know, Google's is do no evil. And one of them we talked about is plumbers. Plumbers protect the health of the nation. Those are incredibly important pieces, but we don't have kind of the same pieces for electricians or heating and air conditioning. And in the leadership meeting, I brought up Gettle and said, you know, I can't remember Gettle's exact words, but it's that they make the desert livable. Like that's very important. And we essentially bring, you know, we make our own weather inside of a house as heating and air conditioning techs. People need to see us in that light. And it was just so eye opening yeah. hearing this other person and the light. Granted, I wasn't dressed the part. There was plenty of, you know, women dressed in the nines and men's in suit coats. And then there's little old Travis with his uh, t shirt and my Costco hoodie and my jeans on. And uh, I probably did look a little out of place at the contractor event, but just thought it was interesting that, that that's what it shows. So maybe I just need to dress up a little bit better. I'm not sure. No, I dude, I don't think so. It, so I've got, there's a friend of mine who's a CEO of a, of a large oil company. I'm in Oklahoma for those who don't know. So like oil, natural gas is a big industry oh, here. I actually own oil land in but there's, that area. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of it. Um, but a friend of mine is a CEO of a, of a publicly traded uh, energy company. And this dude, if you were to saw him, you you would totally think the guy's borderline homeless. Like he always wears like beat up t-shirts. His jeans have holes in them. His Bronco is like, it's from the early nineties. It's been beat up. Like the dude is a billionaire um, and looks like a bum. Uh, but I think it goes to show that uh, <laughs> sometimes the most powerful and successful people don't really care about impressing other people. <laughs> like, there's that sort of notion and people who are like wanting to impress people, like that's all they got, you know, like I kind of feel bad for the lady of like, ah, you're so focused on the brand of jacket or whatever. Like that's, that's cute. Like poor lady. And so that kind of goes back to the original statement of the, the more I needed to impress people, the the more I spoke, the less I need to impress, the less I speak. And it, it definitely kind of holds true on, on all of those pieces. And that's, what's, that's what's nice about have that that backing and just being able to kind of not have to give a fuck as much anymore and just be out there ready to go. You're doing it for you and your team and not a whole lot of other people. Okay, so I I don't know if you're comfortable saying this. I didn't even ask you this before I hit record, so I'm kind of curious. So so you have a you have a term that you're like, hey, you wanted to stay with Sky after the transition as long as possible. Mm-hmm. And and I don't know if you want to talk about the term that you've negotiated, but the point is when you think about now, like five years from now, 10 years from now, like looking ahead, like what's next for, for Travis Smith? Like where, where do you see your mind and your energy starting to focus? Like what, yep. you don't strike me as someone who like, who just wants to sit on the dock and fish all day. I think you'd go out batshit crazy. Like what's, what's getting your wheels turning right now? I'm still working on that. And that's, I think the piece that I'm trying to find, I've got a, another heating and air conditioning company that I'm involved with. It's a, a project and um, the three of us are working very hard on that to see what we can do down there. And we've had some amazing starts. Um, you know, like I said, I've got some other investments in real estate. Uh, I've got some land in Oklahoma. Um, just working on a lot of things, but I know that it's either going to be a, a white snowy mountain, which is where we currently have our second home or a warm tropical beach at some point. Like I've, I've always wanted, and that's always been my dream to be able to wake up on water and go out paddle boarding or foiling or surfing. I don't even surf, but it sounds like fun. Um, but just to be out on something that's a nice warm water, maybe that ends up just being a warm heated pool in the backyard. 
but I want to be able to be on warm water at some point, whether that's five years, 10 years, 30 years, I'm not really sure, but that is the, still the end goal. But for now it's fun. Um, you know, before the podcast tonight, I can kind of say a little bit, but we were talking about my employment agreement and how long that was. And, um, you know, I'm definitely staying on a lot longer than it is. And we originally tried to negotiate for me to stay on longer. And uh, now it's like, yep, we, we want you to stay on. Please don't go. Please stay. And that's the same way I'm feeling. Let's let's stay on here. Let's kick some ass. And let's do something together as long as it stays fun. And the equity group's making it fun. So I'll keep uh, doing what I can to bust my butt for them, especially since I'm, I'm reinvested in that and believe in it and wholeheartedly yeah. believe in the mission of putting people first because that's what we do here. What is what is something that you know now about everything involving prepping for the exit, the actual exit itself, that you wish you would have known a year ago, two years ago, five years ago? Um, I'm going to go into the nitty gritty because this is the stuff that I think people don't talk about. There's a lot of other information you can get. You're going to argue over the stupidest shit and you're not going to know why you're arguing over it. I'm not sure if I can say these things, so I, I won't say too much, but you'll argue over something. You're going to go, why is this even being brought up in conversation? Why does this matter? And it's their attorneys I had, arguing against your attorneys and beh behind your attorneys is you and behind their attorneys is them. I'm sure that a broker, I'm sure the attorneys will tell you not to do this, but at some point you just need to cut out the attorneys and get to each other because there were things that we argued over for days that almost held up the sale. Hmm. Minuscule things. We're talking like things worth less than a hundred dollars and they're arguing over it. three days later we had no resolution i finally just called the equity group and i was like what the fuck and they go what the fuck why are we why are we arguing over this like this should never have been brought up they call their attorney who calls my attorney who calls me and says hey we got it taken care of i'm like no you guys didn't get taken care of but we got it taken care of <laughs> if you find the right equity group sometimes you just need to go straight to them and say why are we arguing over this and half the time they're going to go we have no idea why we're arguing over this this is just a standard attorney thing they never ran it by us and the number of conversations once again this is our equity group and results may vary with other ones the number of times i called the managing partner and it was handled minutes later that would have saved me so much heartache if i would have known that the managing partner was there to get shit done and not to nickel and dime and the entire time through the process, um, the managing partner has been incredible. And I know that's not a standard piece of private right. equity. Um, right. the, the way that I mean, our managing partner actually does stand up comedy. How cool is that? Oh yeah. He, that is crazy. I have never seen him in a suit and tie. He's 29 years old. Um, Harvard educated, but when you meet him, he, he is like us. he, he looks the same. He talks the same. He does awesome, raunchy stand-up comedy, and he is just a good, down-to-earth guy that I love hanging out with. And every time he gets it handled, because we're in alignment on our views and our values. So the biggest piece there is find somebody that aligns with your views and values. Don't simply go after the highest offer, unless you're looking at being gone and, and never seeing those people again. That's a whole different scenario, and you do you on that one. But for me, wanting to stay around, I wanted a, a managing partner. I wanted a CEO that we fully were in align alignment with because that's how shit gets handled that's how we win every single day i love the priority putting on values because i think values i think i think because they're not quite as sexy right you it, you don't like there's no vanity in values it's harder for people to realize how important they are in something like this but really it determines like not only what you fight over and what you like those sort of things but also the way in which you interact and when you have companies like like this group where you guys have that alignment, it makes navigating all those the decisions and the complications just so much easier to the point where you could just pick up the phone and bypass the legal structure. Like that is something that uh, if you don't have shared values, that that just won't fly. It yeah, just won't fly. And that small amount extra that you're going to get from the the slightly higher offer, I assure you that level of money probably won't change your happiness and lower your stress level because you can't go out and buy a, a Ferrari or a Porsche to lower your stress level that much. But having that line of communication and having that value alignment um, is something that money just can't buy. And after going through the process, now I don't want to also make this sound like it's nothing but rainbows and unicorns because it hasn't been. As I said, we've had little arguments and this is pre-sale by the way. Uh, where it was the tiniest little shit and it was an argument. But once we got around that, and even after the sale, it's not been perfect. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. You're always going to have this vision 
and it's not going to always perfectly align. But the more you get that vision straight, the closer it will align. And in the end, the easiest or the biggest thing I can say is that when we've had our ups and downs, when we've had our loop to loops, and I kind of describe it as a roller coaster, the first couple of months are the biggest drops and spins. Now we're getting close to the, you know, the end where it's just little bumps and things and it's, it's fun. And we're all back to that piece. Um, but just knowing that it's going to get taken care of and putting trust in the other person, because there's a lot of money at play. There's a lot of employees and other lives at stake here. So knowing that you've got somebody on your team is there's no value that you can put to that. But I, you just, you just like blew through something I think is a really big point, And that is the idea of trust. Like you have to be able to trust your PE partners that they will do the right thing, that they will honor their commitments, that all those things will happen. Uh, your team needs to be able to honor your decisions and trust your decisions that you navigated this in the best way you knew how, not that it was maybe perfect or whatever you might, you might be able to go back and look and do a postmortem and think I probably might do this different next time, but your team has to be able to trust in your leadership that you bring out for them. Right? Like there's just a whole lot of shared trust because uh, if you don't have the shared trust, that first drop of the roller coaster, as you describe it, everyone starts pulling out weapons. Everyone starts pointing at each other. Like everyone starts going batshit crazy. Uh, and it's only, it's only because there's trust that the roller coaster starts stabilizing. Right? Yeah. Like if, if that's the only way you go, Oh, we've, we've done these turns. We've done this before. This is no big deal. We're like we got this. Yeah. Uh, that trust thing I think is a really important component. Yeah. And I, I'd say they built that up very quickly because it's not to say that we didn't like, you know, immediately kind of go, wait a minute. Whoa. You know, as we're getting to know each other, but the more we got to know each other, the more we spent time in person because so much of it is just via Zoom at first. Once they started coming out and they really spent time to get to know us, they took time to get to know us as well as to you know tell their story to us, that trust grew very, very quickly. And that was vitally important to the whole process of, of how we got to where we are today of a nice kind of calm level area. Um, but yeah, I don't want you to think that, like I said, there was all rainbows and sunshine and unicorns because we did have those kind of hold up moments, <laughs> but after watching them make the right decisions and them, I'm assuming watching us make the right decisions, it's now very mutually trustful on both sides that, Hey, we're all here to kick ass and we're all here to win together. And that's what we want while putting the people of the organization first. Good for you, man. I am super happy that this process went as well as it did. I am very envious and happy for your success. And uh, I, I hope sooner rather than later, you get yourself your mountain and your water. <laughs> and uh, uh, very happy that your quality of life seems to obviously be improving. So, yeah. dude, super happy for you. Thank Thanks you. for coming by again because you always, it's always awesome talking to you, like on Facebook or on here. Like, it's just always great. So yeah, dude, congratulations on the success, man. Well, thank you. I, I've got to obviously add my plug for the people that made that happen over uh, at SFMP with Brian and Fred over there and the whole team um, from the accounting team there that, man, it may have been tough working with them to get all those numbers right, but they helped us come to that right decision and really thankful for Fred's guidance on getting to the right equity group for us because that's such a big piece and, and a big fit. Um to make sure that we got to this point today where I can smile and, and say, yep, let's do the podcast and uh, not have to worry about going, Oh, what are they going to say? Or what is this going to look like? It's just very freeing. Dude, that's awesome. And yeah, we've had Brian on the show a handful of times. So I'll make sure the SF and P is linked in the show notes too. If anyone wants to reach out to Brian Cohen, cause the dude is incredible. Dude. Uh, it's always good to see you, man. Uh, congrats again. Super Thank happy you. for you. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see what's next. Uh, awesome. Thanks, Ryan. This episode was hosted by Ryan Redding, author of the book on digital marketing for plumbing and HVAC contractors and founder of Leveragey, the digital marketing solution for serious home service companies. You can subscribe to Blue Collar CEO on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us online at bluecollar.ceo and find us on Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode. See you soon.